Hello and welcome to this session which is an introduction to further applied mathematics and my name is Judith Madison. First of all, we'll just have a look at how the AS and A level further maths qualifications are made up. So for an AS level in further mathematics, there are three units which are all equally weighted, all one and a half hour exams. Unit one is pure maths. Units two and three are applied. So what we're going to look at in this session, we're going to look at some of the further statistics from unit two and then some of the further mechanics from unit three. Um, some of you may choose to do a full A level in further mathematics, so in which case you must also complete two extra units. Unit four, further pure, is compulsory. And then there is a choice. So on the applied maths, you either do unit five, which is further statistics B, or you do unit six, which is further mechanics B. And this is the only point in all the A-level maths and A-level further maths that you have a choice of units. So if you do choose to do a full A-level in further maths, then your choice as to whether you do the statistics or the mechanics will be determined largely by what course you wish to do at university. So um, mechanics is a must if you want to do physics or an engineering type degree. And statistics is recommended if you wish to do geography, biology or any social science. So, first of all, the further statistics. This is a list of the topics in the WJEC AS level further statistics, the unit two. Um, you will have met quite a bit of probability at GCSE. Um, you will have met correlation at GCSE, obviously, at the further maths level, it takes these topics uh, much into much greater depth. The extra topics at the bottom are the ones that you would also do if you choose the further statistics option, unit five, if you were to do the full A level in further maths. So what we're going to do now, we're not going to try and go through every single topic. We're going to look at one topic that you already know a little bit about, which is correlation. So we have here um, some data, which is paired data. Um, and each of these points represents a pair of values. So we basically have a scatter diagram. And the question is, can we find the equation of what is called the regression line? Now, at GCSE, you would have found a line of best fit. So you'd have had a scatter diagram, and you would have, by eye, drawn a line of best fit, fit through these points. So what we will be looking at in the A-level further statistics is finding a line which is called the regression line, which is the best line of best fit, if you like. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to share with you a GeoGebra file to illustrate. On the screen, we have 20 points, a scatter diagram with 20 points on. You should be able to see this point in black here is the point 0 0.67, 1.34. 
This is the mean point. So there are 20 blue uh, points, 20 blue dots there. And if I take the mean of all the x values, I get 0 0.67. If I take the mean of all the y values, I get 1.34. Hence, this is the mean point. So for instance, if I just move this point along a bit, you can see that the mean changes. Now, at GCSE, when you were drawing your line of best fit, you would look at the points and you would draw the line by eye and it would have to go through this mean point. And you would try and get roughly as many points above the line as below the line. But when you did that, your line would not be absolutely identical to your friend sitting next to you. Everybody would have a very slightly different line. So what we're going to look at now is uh, a better way of doing it but by eye and coming up with an exact line, the best line possible, which is called a regression line. Okay, let me first of all just show any general line as you would do at GCSE. So this red line here goes through that mean point. So this is a line of best fit drawn by eye as you would do at GCSE. If you look, quite a lot of points are above the line, quite a lot are below. What we've got here, we have got vertical lines from each point onto the regression line. Now the points above the line, these vertical distances, which are called residuals, are positive. For the points below the line, the residuals, these vertical distances, are negative. So the residual is the distance from the point to the line. It's positive if the point's above the line. It's negative if the point is below the line. Now, we're going to get the regression line by, we want to make these residuals, the sum of all the residuals, as small as possible. But we can't just add them all up because the positive ones above the line and the negative ones below will just cancel out. So we get rid of that by squaring the residuals. So if I take the square of the residuals, so this is a positive residual, a positive number, and I square it and it's positive. This point here is below the line, the residual, that distance, that number there will be neg the negative distance. If I square it, it is still a positive number. So I get rid of pluses and minuses cancelling by squaring the residuals. And the best line will have the sum of the squares of all those residuals as small as possible. So if we look at the moment, the sum of the squares of the residuals for these 20 points is 62.95. So if I just turn the line using this little dot here, let's see what happens. So um, that's a much bigger residual now. That's up to 65. So let's go the other way. I'm trying to make it as small as possible. Hopefully you can see this number going down. 61.63, that's pretty good. 60.88, not bad. Let's see if I can get it smaller. 61. Started to go up again now, 61. So it was 60 point something, wasn't it? But there. If I click show the regression line, it will show the least squares regression line, the best line the line that minimizes the sum of the squares of all those residuals so that there is a unique answer. There's only one answer. Um, 60.39, so I was a little bit out there. There it is, 60.39, that's the best line, the blue one. Put mine there with it. So we can see that that's the best line because by moving around, we found the minimum, the smallest number for the sum of the squares of the residuals. And this has also given us the equation of that line. 
y equals 0.32x plus 1.11. So this GeoGebra file is just showing you what we are trying to do by finding an equation of a regression line rather than just drawing a line of best fit. Um, and this computer package has calculated the regression line. Um, when you are doing further statistics, um, you can find that line in two ways. You can have a statistics calculator for which you key in the X and Y values of the data and it will give you the answer. And you will also see how to do it by using formula. But I'm not actually going to go through all the formula in this session. Um, so I mentioned a calculator. In order to do A-level maths and A-level further maths, you will need a calculator which has got statistical distributions on it. So this has got more stats functions on it than the calculator that you probably used at GCSE. So the calculator on the screen here, a Casio class WIS, is a very good calculator and it has got all the functions that you need on it. So this Casio class WIS FX uh, 991 EX is a very good calculator uh, and you will be shown um, how to use that to get the regression line um, in your lessons. Okay, so that's just having given you a flavour of some of the AS level further statistics. So if we now move on and have a look at some of the further mechanics. So these are the topics. These are the topics in WJEC AS level further mechanics. And uh, I mentioned physics earlier. You can see that a lot of these topics are ones that you would also meet in physics. Um, momentum, energy, power, etc. And for those who choose to do the mechanics option, if they are doing a full A level in further, further mechanics, these are the extra topics that you would then do. So, what we're going to do now, I'm just going to pick one of these topics that you possibly know something about already and then just ha have a look at how this works in mechanics. So we're going to have a look at collisions. So in snooker, one ball collides with another and we're going to investigate what happens. So this is going to be to do with momentum. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share another GeoGebra file to illustrate this. What we have on the screen now, we have two particles, A and B. So the mass of particle A is 2, that's 2 kilograms. The mass of particle B is 5, that's 5 kilograms. And we have the initial velocities. U A, the initial velocity of A is 4, 4 meters per second, and the initial velocity of B is 1, 1 meter per second. Um, you can see that A is to the left of B, and A is moving faster than B, 4 meters per second versus 1. So obviously A is going to collide with B. And we'll have a look at the animation in a moment. But before we do, we've got this slider with E equals 0 0.5. E is a measure of how elastic the particles are. So E is called the coefficient of restitution. And it is a number between 0 and 1. So at the moment, it's in the middle of the scale at 0 0.5. And we'll talk about that a little bit later 
after we've looked at a few of these animations. So if you just look at A and B, here they are, A's of mass 2, B's of mass 5, hence uh, the larger blob there. Um, a is going to be moving at 4 meters per second to the right. B is going to be moving at 1 meter per second also to the right. So if I start the animation, we can see what's going to happen. So as you can see, A collided with B, and now they are both moving off to the right. So if we look at over here, the velocity of A after the collision is 0 0.79 meters per second and the velocity of b is 2.29 and you could see that b was obviously moving much faster than a the other thing that we've got here which is interesting is the kinetic energy lost kinetic energy is energy a body has because it is moving so both bodies are moving at the beginning so there was kinetic energy at the start and both bodies are moving at the end, this kinetic energy at the end. But if we look here, the kinetic energy is lost during the collision. So at the, after the collision, there is less kinetic energy than there was at the beginning, and we have lost 4.82 joules of kinetic energy. Now, you may recall from physics that you cannot create or destroy energy. So if that kinetic energy has been lost, it must have been changed into some other kind of energy. And if you've ever played snooker or pool, then if you think about it, as one ball hits the other, you can hear it. There is sound. There may also be a small amount of heat energy or other types of energy, but the main energy that is lost from the kinetic energy is a transfer into sound. Let's um, just reset it and let me change the speed of B to zero. So now B is stationary and A is moving. I've left everything else the same. So let's watch uh, and see what happens this time. So B was stationary, A collided with B. You can see B is moving off to the right. So have a look at A. A is moving to the left. If you look here, it says the speed of A after the collision is minus 0 0.29. The velocity of A after the collision is 0 0.29 negative. Negative 0 0.29 meters per second. The negative sign indicates that it is moving to the left. So positive velocities are moving to the right. If they have a negative velocity, it means it's going in the other direction. So the minus is just showing us that A is moving to the left. Um, and kinetic energy, again, lost in the collision, this time 8.57 joules. This time, let's have A and B moving towards each other. So A is already moving to the right. So let's have B moving to the left. So if it's moving to the left, it would have to have a negative initial velocity. So let me just move the slider along. There we are, minus one, that will do. So if the initial velocity of B is minus one, that means it's moving at one meter per second, but to the left. Okay, so let's watch what happens to them when I start the animation. So they move towards each other, they collided, and now they are both moving away from each other. So if you look, A is moving to the left, so A has rebounded and now has a negative velocity, minus 1.36 meters per second. B has rebounded. Initially, it was moving to the left. B is now moving to the right. It has a positive velocity, 1.14, and we have lost 13.39 joules of kinetic energy. All right, what I'm going to do now, I'll just put this one back up to where it was at the beginning, to 1. 
so that they're both moving to the right. And let's have a look what happens when we change the E value. We've had 0 0.5 throughout the animation so far. And we said E can take a value between 0 and 1. So if I just slide it down to this end of the scale, so E is 0. Let's see what happens now with E equal to 0. So notice B and A are moving together, like they're stuck together. And if we look at this, the speeds or the velocities of A and B after the collision, they are identical. They're both 1.86 meters per second. So if E is equal to zero, we have inelastic particles. Remember, E is a measure of how elastic the particles are. E equals zero, we have inelastic particles. That means the particles coalesce. In other words, they stick together. So a practical case where you could have that, you could have an engine um, moving and hitting a carriage on a train and picking it up and the two moving together. Then you would have that they have the same speed after the collision. Let's look what happens now if I put E to the other end of the scale. So if I put E is equal to 1. Okay, so they've... Um, A has rebounded, is moving to the left to the speed of minus 0 0.29 meters per second. B is shot off off the screen at 2.71 meters per second. But this is the interesting bit, the kinetic energy. This time, there is no kinetic energy lost in the collision. So when we have E equal to 1, we have perfectly elastic particles. So perfectly elastic, so there is no kinetic energy lost. So in practical or real life terms, this is very, very unlikely to happen because usually you're going to have, as we said, with snooker balls or uh, playing pool with the balls hitting each other, you're going to have sound energy, you're going to have some energy lost from kinetic energy into sound. So if E is equal to 1, there is no energy lost at all, perfectly elastic. So what we're going to do now, we're just going to have a look at where these numbers are coming from. So the information we were given, we were given for each of the two bodies or particles, we were given their masses and U the initial velocity for each of them. And we were also given the value for E. And then this GeoGebra um, program has calculated the final speed. So what we're going to look at is how we could do those by using equations. We have here, before the collision, um, in general terms now, so that we can get some formula. If this first particle has a mass of m1, and the initial velocity we'll call u1, and the second particle, uh, mass m2, and initial velocity u2. And then after the collision, we will say that the first one has velocity v1, and the second one velocity v2. Now, there are two things that we need to find. We need to find v1 and v2. So if we have two unknowns, we need two equations. The first equation comes from the principle of conservation of linear momentum. So the linear momentum is conserved. The total linear moment momentum before the collision is equal to the momentum afterwards. Momentum is just mass multiplied by velocity. So before the collision, this one has a mass of m1 and a velocity of u1, so the momentum is m1u1. So this first one, m1 times u1 for the momentum. 
and this one before the collision momentum m2 times u2 so the total momentum we just add them and that must equal the total momentum afterwards so this body still has a mass of m1 but the velocity is v1 so the momentum is m1 v1 and similarly this one has momentum m2 v2 so that would give us one equation principle of conservation of linear momentum the second equation comes from newton's experimental law and this says that e that e that coefficient of restitution which is a measure of how elastic the particles are that is the speed of separation divided by the speed of approach so before the collision um, the first particle is moving faster than the second one and catching up with it it is approaching it so if before the collision this one is moving at three meters per second and this one is moving at five meters per second then this one is catching up with this one at two meters per second if this one is going at five and this one's only going at three then this one is going two meters per second faster so the speed of approach is u1 minus u2 after the collision the one this one will be going faster the one at the front so the speed of separation will be v2 minus v1 so after the um, collision if this one say is moving at two meters per second and this one is only moving at one meter per second then the speed at which they're separating is two take away one which is one so the top of the fraction is the speed of separation v2 minus v1 the bottom of the fraction is the speed of approach u1 minus u2 so notice the ones and the twos are a uh, different way around on the top than on the bottom so this gives us two equations and then some gcse algebra will enable us to solve let's just look at one simple question before the collision i have a six kilogram mass moving to the right at five meters per second and it's going to collide with this four kilogram mass which is moving at only three meters per second i've given the value of e as a quarter and what we want to do is to find the speeds the velocities of each of the masses afterwards the v1 and the v2 we don't know whether this particle might rebound and move to the left but we always just put the v1s and v2 is both going to the right this one has to go to the right anyway and um, if it ends up rebounding we'll just end up with a negative answer so we'll always put the, the v's to the right we get our first equation from the principle of conservation of linear momentum so mass times velocity so this one six times five and then the momentum of this one mass times velocity four times three so six times five added to the four times three then the momentum after the collision this is six times v1 this one is four times v2 so we get this equation using uh, the rules of algebra bodmus on the left hand side uh, do the multiplication first so six fives are 30 and four threes are 12. Um, i've just tidied this up six v1 and four v2 30 and 12 is 42 so if we just write that with the variables the v's on the left hand side six v1 and four v2 is 42 is my first equation now if we use newton's law The E on the left hand side we are told is a quarter. The top of the fraction is V2 minus V1. These are the two unknowns we are trying to find. The bottom of the fraction is the speed of approach, U1 minus U2. 
So that's five, take away three. The bottom of this fraction, five take away three is two. So if I multiply through by two to get rid of that fraction, then I'll have two times a quarter, which is a half. So V2 minus V1 is a half. So we've used the principle of conservation of linear momentum, and we've used Newton's experimental law, and we have two equations. We have a pair of simultaneous equations. So there they are, and now we just need to solve them. If we look at the coefficients in this one, 6, 4, and 42 are all even. So I could divide the equation by 2. So the 6, the 4, and the 42 now become 3, 2, and 21. If I look at this equation, if I multiply this one through by 2, I will clear the fractions. So I will get 2v2 minus 2v1, and then 2 times a half gives me 1, and I have now got a simplified pair of simultaneous equations. We don't need to do any further um, multiplying or rearranging because we have got plus 2v2 in the top equation and we have got a positive 2v2 in the second one. So note with these equations that this one is in the usual order with v1 first and v2 second, but be aware that in this equation the v2 term comes first. So because I've got a plus 2v2 in both of them, if I subtract, if I use the elimination method and subtract, then plus 2v2, subtract 2v2 will disappear. So if I'm subtracting, I've got 3v1 and I'm subtracting minus 2v1. So 3v1, if I subtract negative 2v1, that becomes 3v1 plus 2v1, which is 5v1. And remember, I'm subtracting to eliminate the 2v2s. 21 subtract 1 gives me 20. And then if I divide by 5, I get the velocity of the first one after the collision as 4 meters per second. Finally, I need to find the value for V2 by substituting. This second equation looks like the simplest one. So if I replace that V1 with the 4, V2 minus 4 is 0 0.5, giving V2 as 4.5. So if we just have a look at our little diagram, this is the situation before. And after the collision, the first one has a positive velocity, so it's moving to the right at 4 meters per second. There it is. And the second one has a velocity of 4.5, so moving to the right at 4.5 meters per second. So just some straightforward GCSE algebra to solve once we have the two equations. So what we've looked at in this session, we've had uh, a look at some of the further statistics and some of the further mechanics on the AS level further maths. If you would like more information, then um, you are able to contact the Further Maths Support Programme Wales and you have got the email address there and underneath there is the website which has which is where I'm getting these Jojoba resources from. So there is information on the website as well. Okay, thank you for um, listening to this recording and um, I wish you all the best with your studies. Thank you.